Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, November 7th, 2023, our second episode today. Good to have you on board, as always, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. What makes good vision coverage? I knew it when I saw it. Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members, access to over 125,000 independent providers and national retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. And before I get to my guest, I want to highlight a couple things that are happening at the Institute and in the pages of proceedings. Uh, this month, our CEO and pu publisher for the past 12 years, retired Navy Vice Admiral Pete Daly, is turning over with his relief, retired Rear Admiral Ray Spicer. Admiral Spicer, who was a surface warfare officer in the Navy and later held senior positions at Boeing and IBM, will officially have the con on 1 December. We will miss Admiral Daly as, uh, as our CEO for 12 plus years. He has taken the Institute from a uh, uh, probably troubled waters, shoal waters about in 2011 and, and put us on the right course and really turned the Institute around. And um, he's been transformational as a CEO and probably the best uh, best boss I've ever worked for. And then I'm not just uh, saying that he's he's been a guy with vision and he's done a tremendous amount to keep the Naval Institute uh, or make the Naval Institute healthy for the next 150 years. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight is coming in the December issue of proceedings, we're going to be kicking off the third phase of the American Sea Power Project. This phase will start with a China-Taiwan conflict scenario set in 2026 followed by a series of essays by warfare area experts, undersea warfare, surface, strike, amphibious, mine warfare, etc. Additional articles will be published in the January issue, followed by a new essay contest called the Future of Naval Warfare Essay Contest, where we invite you, our readers and listeners, to respond to the scenario and the articles written by the experts and build on them. For example, Admiral Sandy Winnefeld has written the uh, mine warfare uh, essay for this series. Uh, so mine warfare experts or people thinking about mine warfare might read Admiral Winterfeld's piece, read the scenario and say, yes, and, or yes, but, or no, but, but we want to continue the conversation going from the American Sea Power Project into this future naval warfare essay contest. Don't miss it. December, American Sea Power. Okay. Now those uh, two announcements out of the way. My guest today Joining us from College Station, Texas, is Lieutenant Colonel Brian Donlin, United States Marine Corps. He's the winner of our 2023 Marine Corps Essay Contest. His article, Logistics 2030, Foraging is Not Going to Cut It, is in the November issue of Proceedings. It starts on pages 20 to 21. Brian, welcome to the show, and congratulations on winning the prize. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Well, it's great to great to talk to you. So, uh, other than the five thousand dollar prize money, uh, what motivated you write to write on this topic? Well, well, frankly, I got four sons, so uh, between bail money and tuition, prize money never <laughs> hurts. Uh, but frankly, it was it was really three more intangible things that uh, inspired me to write what I did. Um, the first and really the most important is that I've been a Marine officer for almost twenty two years, and throughout that time, I've been blessed with some really incredibly talented Marine Corps logistics officers that I've gotten to work with. As a battalion operations officer in Afghanistan, I had a guy who could move mountains. Um, as a graduate of the, the Marine Corps School of Advanced Warfighting and then a planner at three Marine Expeditionary Force in Okinawa, I worked with exceptional logisticians who taught me so much about uh, what it was they did to make the Blue Arrows I draw a reality. Um, and then as a battalion commander, I had a, I had a logistician. Go ahead. You're, a, uh, you're an infantry officer. You're not a logistician. I, I'm not a logistician at all. I, I, I'm a I'm an infantry officer who has been blessed by just being exposed to these guys. Sir. Exactly. Um, and then as a battalion commander, I had an S4 and then a logistics company commander who's attached to me who they could just think through problems on a different level. And, you know, I, I had a retired uh, logistics general write me this week after reading my article um, and he summarized really, really well what all these logisticians have taught me over the years, which is when properly planned and executed logistics, this is his words, logistics is the rich oxygen of warfare. And when he wrote that to me, that really drove home kind of the first thing that 
uh, made me want to write this, which is that I have a deep respect and appreciation that logistics is one of the war fighting functions, but it very much is the critical enabling function for operations. So the first thing was I was inspired by those guys. Uh, the second really goes back to what I said before about being a planner out in 3MEF in Okinawa. Um, you know, the Navy's got 7th Fleet. We've got 3MEF in Okinawa. Those are both forward deployed naval forces in the Western Pacific. Um, and if you're out there, I think you have a different appreciation for logistics than other places. Um, if you start thinking about the Pacific, it's huge. It's vast. I mean, it's the old uh, General Douglas MacArthur in World War II used to have a map in his CP. And on the map was an outline of the continental United States. So he could show visitors that his AO was four or five times bigger than the continental United States. Um, I remember when I was out in 3MF, PACOM used to say uh, they owned everything from Bollywood to Hollywood, polar bears to penguins. So if you're out there, you really tend to appreciate logistics differently. Um, and I was really blessed to serve under some extremely talented general officers when I was out there. They were grunts and they were aviators, but as one of their war planners, they didn't let me get away with uh Ferry dusting, logistics. Um, so my, my lived experience is what kind of drove that vignette and also inspired me to write this. Um, and then the final thing, I, I want to give credit to your organization, sir, because, you know, as I told you before, I, I happened to be on the editorial board 2007, 2010 under Major General Wilkerson. And he used to say to me all the time, he's like, don't be a plank owner. Don't be a plank owner. And I had to admit to him that this grunt had no idea what a plank owner was. And he told me, hey, it's, it's a person who's on the first crew of a newly commissioned ship. And he said, Brian, be proud of the fact that you are an infantry officer. Be proud of the fact that you've been to Iraq a couple of times, but don't let that define you. Learn new things. Think critically. So being exposed to those logisticians, uh, having that exposure in 3MF to the problem set and people who drove me to understand it. And then three, working, working for somebody at the Naval Institute who really told me to expand my mental horizons. Uh, made me want to write this article and made proceedings, regardless of the prize money, the first place I was going to submit it to. So yeah, that's, that's a long answer to your question, but that's what drove me to it. No, that's great stuff. And uh, uh, I will, uh, for our, our listeners who haven't had a chance to read the article yet, it starts off with this vignette where a 3MF uh, planner, uh, a major, a young major, as you put it, you know, is providing a brief, a war plan brief to the, the commanding general. And he starts talking about, you know, all the, the plan. And then the general starts firing off questions at him, which are logistics questions like, OK, how are we going to get there? What's the road network when we get there? Um, you know, are we going by ship or aircraft or both? And which, you know, what's the fuel and how what's the fuel consumption rate? All these questions are in that vignette. It's like, boom, boom, boom. And the, the you know, the young major sort of deer in the headlights and then you know then you go on with the uh, with the article so that's how it starts off and it's a it's a compelling vignette we've all you know been uh, staff officers and uh, you know been uh, you know had questions from uh, flag and general officers fired at us like that and so it it puts you in a it, it puts you in a, a uh, uh, I guess a, uh, a familiar sort of uneasy kind of tension at the start of the article before you dive into how you describe the problem and then you describe what are some things that can be done about it. So I, I want to get to that next. The Marine Corps, I mean, all of our readers and listeners are, are, are very aware because we've had General Smith, we had General Berger on the show, um, and uh, both Smith and Berger have written uh, for proceedings. Uh, but there's been a lot of change happening in the last five or six years, especially under you know, former Commandant Berger's tenure. tenure. And, and so for uh, you know, some of our listeners who perhaps haven't read all the documents, take us up through some of those guiding documents that are shaping uh, the Marine Corps and also shape your arguments for this article. So, you know, you got Marine Corps Force Design 2030, you got Installations and Logistics 2030, you got the Commandant's Plan and Guidance of 2018, I think it was, or 2019 from General Berger. All those things kind of set the stage. Describe that a little bit, if you would. Absolutely. Uh, now first off, I want to begin. I'm, that's a great question. I am not an expert in all the ins and outs of this. Uh, I would describe uh, force design as a, as a pretty fast moving vehicle uh, in multiple directions. So there are probably people who know better the ins and outs. But what I'll give you is, is kind of the, uh, 
as a generalist infantry officer, my take on what I've seen. The first is, you know, if you're going to really understand Force Design 2030, you don't actually start with General Berger. You start with his predecessor, General Neller, and a document that his cornerstone document, something called the Marine Operating Concept, nicknamed the Mock. Um, and really, the Mock had a pretty simple thesis to it, which was that the Marine Corps is not manned, trained, and equipped for a 21st century warfighter. In other words, hey, we're not prepared to deal with the emerging threats we see on the horizon, whether they're asymmetric and non-state or whether they're great power. We're not postured where we need to be. That's a pretty typical, um, what I'll call post-war message for a force, especially coming out of something as long as what we did in Iraq, Afghanistan. So there's almost a seamless handoff between General Neller and General Berger. And that General Berger comes on deck and accepts pretty much the exact same problem statement, which is we're not man-trained equipped for what we need to do in the war plans and what we need to do for the emerging threats. So he issues his commandant's planning guidance uh, immediately in 2019, which directs the force to start getting after some of these core problems. Um, and then after that, he begins to e issue annual updates uh, that are called the force, force Design 2030 updates, uh, which basically diagnose the problem and begin to lay out specific solutions. Um, now, some of his solutions uh, caught a lot of flack from different quarters. Um, but a lot of that, quite frankly, is the painful process of modernization um, because uh, fiscal reality drove him to have to make some decisions that were divest to invest. In other words, cutting certain capabilities, most famously and most contentiously, I think, were, were tank battalions yeah. in exchange for the procurement of some updated new stuff that better postured us for future conflict. Um, weapons and equipment that would add lethality at the battalion level to a rifle squad. I mean, that equipment set looks so different um, to sensors and uh, C2 apparatus that allowed us to operate in a degraded or denied environment um, to plug into the joint kill webs uh, and to do some sensing at the forward edge of the combatant commanders gray zone in crisis or contingency. Uh, so, so those were the, dynamics that were pushing it forward. Uh, those got a lot of attention, the Force Design 2030 messages that came out every year. Behind them, less well understood, uh, were some concepts. And I talk about those as well in the paper. Um, and a couple of those were Navy Marine Corps concepts. One that I don't mention in the paper was a Navy Army concept. And some other ones were really purely Marine Corps concepts. Uh, on the Navy Marine Corps side, you had littoral operations in the contested environment and multi-domain operations, which talked about how do you bring effects together from ashore and afloat inside of a contested environment, specifically one where you had uh, key terrain uh, in problematic littoral terrain. Um, then you had uh, multi-domain operations, the original one that came out in the Marine Corps co-signed that with the Army. Uh, and then you had some very Marine Corps specific concepts, two in particular. One is expeditionary advanced base operations, and the other is stand-in forces. I was to describe those simply. And again, there are people who know those, sir, way better than I ever will. Really what it came down to was the idea that you have forces already inside the weapons engagement zone of the enemy, the WES. Those forces are there no matter what you do. Four deployed naval forces. What do you want to do with them? Are they capable of taking some of the joint burden to allow the larger joint force to pulse in? So those standing forces would... Uh, establish a temporary capability in a temporary location to allow some bigger punch to come from outside the Wes is in to affect the enemy. It's never a war winning capability. It's always a setting the table capability. And what General Berger believed was that the Marine Corps was uniquely suited for that because it's an expeditionary organization. It's a four deployed naval force. Um, and it's a force that historically has done pretty good in terms of interacting with the joint community. Um, Behind all this, you've got the very latest thing to come out, which is Installations and Logistics 2030. Um, again, brilliant people wrote that. Uh, some of them were actually the, the very logisticians I was referring to earlier. They're the same people who have mentored me in the last 20 years to better understand logistics. They're the ones who authored these documents and then an updated version of uh, Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication for Logistics. Um, and really what INL 2030 is, it's a, it's a vision, it's a program of, 
uh, almost a continuation of Force Design's campaign of learning to get after key questions, key problems, and provide solutions that develop a logistics enterprise that can enable the capabilities that were developed by Force Design 2030 uh, so that they're viable uh, for what we say we're going to do in the concepts and what we say we're going to do in the war plans. As those are great points. And I'm glad that you uh, also uh, mentioned the continuity between uh, General Neller and General Berger. And now um, you, you didn't mention it, but I know General Smith as well, um, that the, the thinking about the threat, the thinking about the missions that the Marine Corps faces, particularly against the pacing threat, which is what a lot of Marines call China, uh, you know, it, it's, it wasn't just General Berger's view on this and, and the divest to invest wasn't, you know, just something that he pulled out of the air. There, there was a lot of thinking that went into it. There was a lot of war gaming that went into it. Um, and there was a lot of, hey, we've got, we really need to um, update our kit update our tactics and our doctrine because we're what we're going to do next possibly is different than what we've done the last 20 years. That's some great points. So your article harkens back to some logistics lessons of the Cold War as a source of ideas that can help the Corps get ready for the future fight. So describe some of those lessons for us from the Cold War. What were the key capabilities? And then, you know, what were the lessons that the Marine Corps or the Joint Force took from from those changes, those adaptations in the Cold War? Well, well, first off, sir, like, like I talked to you a little bit before this began, I, I'm part of a program in the Marine Corps called the Commandant and the Marine Corps Strategist Program, which means I'm out getting a PhD in history. That's why I'm in College Station, Texas. And I'm actually studying military history under one of the greats, a guy named Brian McAllister Lynn. Um, and my research is on the 70s and the 80s. And if you were to go online right now and type in things like recruiting crisis or great power competition, you'll see a lot of the use of the word unprecedented. Mm -hmm. uh, I would disagree. Uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but I think it rhymes a heck of a lot. Um, so when I was looking at the 70s, I was really struck and inspired by how many of the things I was studying were problems we dealt with then and now. Um, one I'd bring up to you is from uh, General Lou Wilson, who, if not our greatest commandant, was certainly one of our top commandants. Um, and while he's really known uh, for reinvigorating the service's broken ethos in the 1970s. There's another story, which is him as a manager of innovation. Um, as I started to look at that period, I realized that in the early 1970s, there was this kind of Marine Corps quest for what I would refer to as technological silver bullets. Panacea is that we could spend money at, and that would revolutionize uh, amphibious operations in the face of what was then the very beginning of A2AD. Uh, with cruise missiles and long-range precision fires and longer sensors. Um, but what's interesting is he breaks with his predecessors, and instead of seeking these technological silver bullets, he starts looking for evolutionary technology. Uh, he cancels a very expensive, high-profile program that was the forerunner of the doomed EFV, um, and he starts taking combined arms focus, saying it doesn't really matter whether one or two weapons is better. What matters is how we work them in symphony. So I looked at that and I said, that makes sense logistically too. There's not a uh, magical robot or miracle sentient artificial intelligence system that's going to solve the problem of logistics for Force Design 2030. But there are a lot of small things that in combination, some of them at a very high technological readiness level and some not so much, that when you combine them work, things like robotics, added manufacturing, small form factor resiliency too, and then some better known stuff like seaplanes and offshore support vessels. Um, by combining those things, I think incrementally, you get a lot closer to making Force Design 2030 logistical viable. So that's the first lesson. Um, another one I'd say is there was an openness by both General Wilson and General Barrow, who is the successor, to accept new forms of strategic mobility, not just amphibious assault, but things like prepositioning in Norway and maritime prepositioning ships. Those were actually opposed in the late 1970s and 1980s by a fair number of Marines who thought it was turning our backs on amphibious routes. Similar to some of the pushback that some of the ideas that General Berger has advanced with Force Design 2030. Um, and then the final one I'd give you is there were really smart civilians behind uh, a lot of this. Uh, one in particular I'd name is Secretary of Defense Harold Brown, who understood that to go from amphibious assault to fully up round maritime prepositioning ships was a long journey 
and he and some very talented congressmen pushed through near-term interim solutions to make these things realistic uh, in the day-to-day immediately. So those are a couple of lessons I pulled uh, from my research that I ended up putting in the piece. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the word unprecedented. When I was uh, working at the Joint Staff as a lieutenant commander, uh, our, my boss was uh, then Rear Admiral Jake Jacoby, who was the J-2. And uh, if an analyst used the word unprecedented, Jacoby <laughs> would like pull out a $100 bill and he would say, prove it. Prove it to me that this has never, ever happened before, right? And so if you use that word, you really had to have done your homework that that nothing like that had ever happened before. Um, and you also, I, I was thinking when you were talking about uh, uh, General Wilson, I was thinking about an article that we had in our American Sea Power art, uh, series by, by John Lehman, who also wrote about that transition more for the Navy than for the Marine Corps, but he wrote about that transition from post-Vietnam into a position where really the U.S. Navy was in a position of weakness coming out of the Vietnam War, ridden hard, put away wet, not enough ships, uh, maintenance backlogs, a lot of things that are very precedented for what's happening today. And then how do we get to the 600 ship Reagan buildup back on top of readiness, uh, back to the, you know, the types of capabilities that we needed to take, you know, the fight to the adversary in what was not then described as A2AD, but very much was. Um, yeah, that kind of environment. So, yeah, that you you raised some really good uh, for me echoes with with some of those other uh, you know uh, past events and and what other authors have have offered. Um, the uh, so it, it helps me and and I think a lot of our readers and you know listeners probably as well. But how, you know, picture a solution or picture the problem and then how it w- what it would look like. So. On the bottom of page 24 in your article, we had a short summary, what we call a a call out box or an inset um, that that kind of talks through, uh, you know, in the Western Pacific, in a fight with China kind of thing, um, uh, what a viable logistics network would look like. Uh, So can you just kind of overview that, give that give our listeners and, and viewers an overview of what that what what you described there? Absolutely. What I begin with saying is a viable logistics network really isn't solving new problems. It's it's solving existing problems, but uh, understanding that the dynamics have shifted. Okay. If you look today at the difficulty of rearming a high Mars missile launcher, let's say you've got specialized equipment. uh, They're large bulky items. They're sensitive. A lot goes into that. Well, if you're in a semi-permissive environment, like Afghanistan or Iraq, where you have basically all domain dominance for the most part. And now I'm taking that and I'm saying, I can't, I don't have all domain dominance. In fact, there may be times where the enemy has superiority in the air, land, sea, or information. Then you have to shift your approach. It changes the logistics from an admin action to an operation. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I go back to one of the logistics I had uh, in Afghanistan. We had to break down firm bases. He made them into operations, not into just something the day to day. And it was, it really taught me a lot as a young, as a young captain. Um, so if you look at what that looks like viably or a viable network looks like, I, I would describe it as kind of a blend of that old Clint Eastwood movie, any which way you can. And uh, s- some lessons from World War II. Uh, the, the first part of that is you're going to need a lot of different solutions, both new and old stuff used in new creative ways, unmanned systems, Added manufacturing, things like that, but also creative employment of things we already have, like L-class ships um, and capabilities like seaplanes and offshore support vessels that already exist out in the civilian world. Um, so that's kind of the any way which you can, a, a network of those different solutions to the problem. Uh, and then you also have to have a long view uh, that looks back across the entire DOD logistics enterprise, it ties into theater logistics. Um, that gives you the ability to reconstitute forces, not just have them in there for one punch, but to push them in and pull them out, reconstitute them, rearm them, and put them back in the fight. Um, And I think if you look at some of the big big books that have been written on World War II logistics, uh, you see a lot of that. You see a mix of multiple creative solutions, some tactical, some technological, um, and then integration with the overall arsenal of democracy. So to me, a viable network looks a lot like what we've done in the past, we're just a little bit out of uh, out of practice with it. That, those muscles have atrophied because 
you're not challenged in the air, land, and sea, and information to the same degree uh, during the war on terror that you would be against a Russia, a China, Iran, a North Korea, or any other country that has that kind of A2A2 capability. Yeah, great points. Um, okay, so I, I'm curious if you've heard any, well, you've mentioned feedback from one retired general uh, already. What what other kinds of feedback have you gotten from your colleagues, counterparts, you know, fellow uh, infantry officers, maybe, or, or logisticians? And, and, you know, is the article getting attention in the Marine Corps? Well, I, I will tell you, I think that uh, the article prided, I probably didn't need to write the article, get attention in the Marine Corps. I think that between General Berger's emphasis on the subject at the end of his tenure and the things that we as a DOD establishment are learning about uh, the military industrial challenges inherent in supporting wars in Ukraine and Israel, I think Marines get that logistics is really important. Uh, and, and for the folks who have been uh, you know, making uh, critiques of force design 2030, logistics has been a consistent message. Um, but, you know, like the Rolling Stones put it, you can't always get what you want, at least not immediately. So General Berger had to make some risk mitigation and choose some certain things first and some things later. Uh, in terms of what I've heard, uh, I've not heard anything from the infantry community. I don't know if I should be afraid about that. Uh, but from logisticians, I've gotten a lot of feedback, um, all positive. Um, many of them have pointed out the things I've missed. So I think I have to publicly uh, thank the logistics community and also apologize for the fact you've got a grunt writing about the subject. Um, but I really hope that, uh, you know, what I'm learning from these folks is that there's a lot, of, lot going on that I don't realize is going on, and it's all positive. And a lot of it's at the grassroots level. Um, so I think that hopefully the article I wrote helps those logisticians move the, the ideas forward uh, so we can enable forces on 2030. So overall, pretty good feedback. Uh, just more I'm learning as I, as I get these messages from these talented professionals. Yeah, that's great. Um, so the, uh, you know, once again, for our listeners, the article is titled Logistics 2030 Foraging is Not Going to Cut It. And, and I would just say, you know, when I came to the Naval Institute seven years ago now, if you would told me back then that we would have in, in the next four or five years of, uh, of publishing proceedings, we would have articles from Marines about pack animals uh, and about foraging. You know, you could have knocked me down with a feather. I'd be like that. But but when, when we got them and then, you know, the authors uh, and we've published on those on those two topics, the authors, you know, really laid out the case that, hey, you know, in this stand-in forces, uh, uh, EABO kind of operations, it, you know, inside the weapons engagement zone of the adversary, where Marines are having to operate in small units and move, shoot, communicate, move uh, in and out, as you said, pulsing forces in and out. Um, you know, in some cases, small groups of Marines might have to forage for a, a period of time. Um, and then, you know, pack animals, animals might be part of the, you know, the problem set, just as they were in, you know, in the Southeast uh, Pacific in World War II. So, um, but your article, yeah, that's, that might be good ideas. And they're teaching, they've been teaching some of that at, uh, you know, to, to second lieutenants at the basic school, but really you need a, a much more, as you put it, a, a, a viable approach is going to be a whole lot of different things tied together in a network uh, to sustain Marines and to sustain, you know, that high tech equipment and all that kinds of stuff in, in that, um, that operating environment. So, uh, you know, I just, this is a terrific article uh, worthy, Thank of you. First, worthy of first prize in this essay contest. I will tell you that the Marines on our editorial board, the two Marines on our board of directors, um, and a couple of the non-Marines on our editorial board, you know, read this and it was, um, it, it quickly went to the top of the 10 articles that we sent because, not because, not just because it's well-written, but also because they all recognize this is uh, a really important topic and we've got to get this right. As, you know, General Berger said, you know, logistics was the pacing function, right? Yes, sir. Marine, you know? Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no. I was agreeing with you, sir. That I think that it's, we've done a superb job in, in putting capabilities in place that allow us to add more to the joint force to help set that table. But now we've got to make sure that they have staying power. Uh, that going back to what I said earlier, uh, the quote I, I took from that uh, retired general, that we're breathing that oxygen into the operating concepts. And that oxygen is logistical in nature. 
Yeah, great point. Um, so before we go, uh, any saved rounds from you? Any anything I should have asked but didn't ask, or uh, you know, comments you wanted to make? Not particular, but we talked about precedent earlier. So if I could say, you know, the old the old joke is uh, want a new idea, go read an old book. I would tell you, want a new idea, go into the proceedings archives because it is fascinating to me what is in there in terms of new ideas that are actually old ideas. And what's even more fascinating is when you find an article written by a really fired up lieutenant commander or major, and then that person becomes an admiral or general and they actually put it in play, uh, you realize that, uh, you know, professional journals aren't just something you do for homework. It's, it's pretty key to, to advancing our, our, the military art. Well, thanks for pointing that out. And I would uh, also highlight that this entire year, which is our 150th anniversary year, uh, we've had an extra eight pages in proceedings every issue where we've gone back and looked at uh, prominent articles throughout our history on the topic of that particular issue. So in this case, in the, in the November issue, we went back and looked at, you know, the first uh, the first articles written by Marines or written about the Marine Corps, you know, back a hundred and something years ago. Um, and then, you know, all, all the way forward, uh, you know, up until uh, till this issue. So it's, it, it has been fascinating to go back as a staff and read, you know, some of those most salient pieces that people, including, you know, Lieutenant Hyman Rickover, Lieutenant Chester Nimitz, you know, Lieutenant Ernest J. King, uh, Chesty, you know, not, I'm sorry, not Chesty Puller, uh, you know, General uh, Jean Lejeune, when he was the commandant, three years as commandant, wrote for proceedings. It's really interesting to see some of that stuff. And and you're right, there's there's very little under the, new under the sun, you know, just new twists, subtle twists on things. Great point. Um, well, we are about out of time. And uh, Brian, it's been great talking to you. My guest, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Donlin. He's the winner of the Marine Corps Essay Contest for 2023, and his article is titled Logistics 2030, Foraging is Not Going to Cut It. It's in the November issue of Proceedings, or if you Google Proceedings, Foraging is Not Going to Cut It, it'll come up on your uh, on your screen, and you can read it. Great piece, and uh, Brian, we look forward to having you write for us again. Thanks very much, sir. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. This episode has been brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. What makes good vision coverage? I knew it when I saw it. Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members, access to over 125,000 independent providers and national retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.